number of times um, over the past uh, five years or so. Uh, Greg did his uh, bachelor degree at MIT, and then he went to Boston University where he worked with Eugene Stanley on uh, nonlinear dynamical systems. And then he's uh, gone on to teach at the University of Arizona, um, Massachusetts, and Connecticut before uh, arriving in Santa Barbara. And he's helped organize the New England um, Physics of Complex Fluids section or meeting. So, and uh, workshop. workshop, okay. And presently, he's the uh, chair elect of the APS topical group on statistical and nonlinear physics. So please welcome Greg. So uh, I think people can hear me. Uh, sounds good. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come and uh, spend the day in the physics department. Uh, a lot of old friends here, and I'm um, always excited to hear what's uh, happening in physics at Brown. That's a great place. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, collaboration between physicists and cell biologists today. Uh, and uh, uh, before I get into the body of it, uh, uh, I thought I would uh, do my acknowledgments first. It's a little bit backwards, but uh, uh, it, it, there's a logic to it. Um, so what I'll talk about is work that involved a large collaboration of people, not just physicists, uh, cell biologists, and also uh, biochemists, uh, and microscopists, it turns out. Um, so uh, I, I do want to emphasize, in particular, a couple people. Mark Terasaki, who is a professor at the University of Connecticut uh, Health Center, uh, and also uh, Jeff Lichtman, who's a professor at Harvard. Um, they uh, both had key contributions to this subject, which uh, I'll get to in the course of the talk. But um, also, this work involved collaborators in Israel and also in Mexico. Um, so it's quite international. Um, I guess I can advance it that way. Uh, so maybe you've heard this term endoplasmic reticulum. If you're a physicist, you might recall it from a biology course or a textbook that you read. It's usually on page 40 of the biology textbooks. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, every high school kid uh, might uh, actually know the term, but they probably don't know much more than it's a complicated word. Um, it, it, there is a mystery involved in this structure. It's a membrane structure. It's inside of almost all of your cells. Um, it's quite extensive. Its total area uh, is much greater than the area of the membrane on the outside of the cell, the plasma membrane. Uh, and it comes in different morphologies, meaning in the same cell, it takes different shapes. And two of the shapes are, I, I like these schematic diagrams. Uh, I'll show a bunch of them. Um, they have some problems, but I like this one. Oops, um, of course, that's too much. Uh, I like this one because it has uh, both mo two morphologies, the sheets. Sometimes, for the purpose of my talk, it's also called the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and the tubular part, which is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The terms rough and smooth are all old terms that come from early electron micrographs, which showed a texture to one type and not the other. Um, in fact, there's a third morphology of the endoplasmic reticulum that's hardly discussed that way, and that's the nuclear envelope itself. And uh, what they have in common uh, that, that you can instantly see is this pink space, at least on this schematic, this pink inner part of the sheets and also of the tubes. That's an enclosed space called a lumen. So uh, lumen is a term that cell biologists use very broadly to mean an enclosed volume that's separated from some other volume. So the 
ER, that's what people call the, that's what biologists call the endoplasmic reticulum. The ER has this enclosed lumen, and in fact, the nuclear, the nuclear envelope also has an enclosed lumen, and they're one in the same. That is, the lumen of the nuclear envelope is connected to the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, making it one gigantic organelle. That's, that's what ER experts would say. Um, people who study the nucleus might have a different point of view. But uh, uh, here's another schematic showing stepping away from the endoplasmic reticulum and how it fits into m most, well, not most, some of the other endomembrane systems in the cell. The Golgi apparatus, uh, lysosomes, uh, vesic uh, vesicle traffic, and so on. Uh, and, and a lot of them aren't shown here, of course. Uh, what's a, pro a problem with this is it doesn't really correctly uh, give uh, justice to the nuclear envelope. It does show that this continuity, that one of the membrane layers is actually right up against the membrane layer of the nucleus of the, the, the that's called the inner nuclear membrane, and this one that's pink is called the outer nuclear membrane. But, uh, but really, what's obscured there is the fact that the lumen, this space between the membranes, is really the same structure, kind of structure, as the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Anyway, it's a mystery how all these things are connected to each other. Um, the schematics don't quite uh, do it justice. Um, why is it important? Well, you can pick up any issue of nature or science and usually find some article about the endoplasmic reticulum. And th those articles are on very different aspects of the endoplasmic reticulum. This one is about something called ER stress. That doesn't mean stress like physicists understand it. It's a specialized term that has to do with uh, w when uh, proteins aren't folded correctly. It's, but uh, but you can see uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, even from this article, it's not a very simple in terms of its function. Like the first sentence here, the endoplasmic reticulum is the main site of protein and lipid synthesis, membrane biogenesis, xenobiotic detoxification, and cellular calcium storage. All of that is true. So this organelle over the period of billions of years of cellular evolution has picked up all of these functions. No one knows what its first function was in the earliest eukaryotic cell. Uh, so it's an enormously complex and important uh, organelle in, in, in you. That's why it's called eukaryotic cells, right? Because they're in you. Uh, <laughs> it's OK, my, my, my Greek scholarship isn't very good there. Uh, so uh, it means true. Thank you. Right. <laughs> you means true in Greek. Uh, so uh, uh, what I want to show in this talk is how this complex, one aspect of this complex organelle can be a bit simplified from physical considerations. And uh, it's a long story, so I have to take you through it in steps. Uh, so I remember, I'll just go back. Uh, uh, to some personal history. Uh, Tom Powers is somewhere in the audience here. Uh, there he is. Uh, I remember around 2001 or 2002, we decided, Tom and I were working on some membrane problems. We said, why don't we work on the endoplasmic reticulum? So we went and sat down with a biologist and said, uh, OK, what do you know? You know? What can we put into our physical models? And the biologist couldn't answer even the very most basic questions we had about the sheet-like endoplasmic reticulum. We wanted to know, like, why are there parallel sheets? What keeps them at a constant separation? If you, in physical terms, why, why is there a wavelength to the structure of the ER sheets? Well, um, they said, uh, we don't really know that. Uh, we, we think it's a protein. A protein's involved. Well, what's the name of the protein? Well, maybe it's something like ubiquitin. They had no idea. They didn't have a protein. 
it, it didn't make much sense that there could be a stiff protein in the cell that could extend over hundreds of nanometers, but they'd never found it and couldn't identify an existing protein. Uh, well, what's the overall topology or shape? Well, we don't know. Uh, so they didn't know enough. We, we decided we're not going to work on that problem. <laughs> it was too complex. The topology was complicated. Uh, uh, so we dropped it. Well, now, I don't know, 15 years later, uh, we, we know more about it. So uh, that's partly what I'm going to talk about. So one fact, which is taken, I think, as uh, lore in cell biology, uh, is that the ER is one connected membrane. Even though it has these different morphologies, and you could say it's composed of different kinds of things, because it's uh, different uh, functions in some of them, uh, it's one continuous membrane. So that begs the question of how these different parts are all connected to each other. How are sheets connected to sheets? Uh, how are, how, there's a the tubular part, looks like a tubular network. How is that connected to sheets? How are the sheets connected to the nuclear envelope? So the schematics that you saw didn't really answer that. But um, I keep generating some kind of noise. Is it something I can fix? I'm just going to give up, I think. Let's try to <laughs> OK, um, in addition to those mysteries, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to end my talk with this one, but I'm going to flash it. This is not working, but uh, I'm, I'm going to flash it right now. Uh, there seem to be very funny characteristic connections between the nuclear envelope and the endoplasmic reticular sheets. And so I've captured uh, some of those connections in these uh, electron micrographs, these are single slices through cells, and showing that every time the ER comes up and hits the nuclear envelope, it seems to form, right at the moment it connects, this funny delta-shaped connector. And this is something we don't quite understand, and it's a, still a mystery, but hopefully by the end of my talk, uh, I'll give some clues as to how one could approach that problem, too. OK, so uh, I'm going to have to do a complicated thing here, which is, uh, let me see if it works. I'm going to show some data. This is actual EM data. So I'm going to show what looks like a movie, but in fact, it's not a movie at all. It's a uh, succession of slices. So it's uh, what the biologists call a Z stack. I'm just going to slice through a cell. And in slicing through the cell, there's no dynamics here, other than you'll see one slice after another. And uh, I'll point out a few things. But I wanted to show the data because it's so spectacular. Uh, so what's stained here is membrane. You won't see anything else in the cell that isn't composed out of a bilayer membrane. So let's, uh, let me see, oops, let me step through it. So that's the interior of one cell. And the kind of stuff you'll see at the edges are other cells that are impinging upon it. Uh, you'll see kind of networks come and go, and uh, cross-sections will be changing here. Uh, the endoplasmic reticular sheets are these squiggles, which in any part of the cell are roughly parallel. Um, but if, for instance, if you go to another uh, part of the cell, that direction that normal direction of the parallel stack has changed. So there it's like this, but before it was pointing in that direction. Uh, you'll see a lot of other stuff in these cross sections. You'll see uh, these circular things. Those are cross sections of mitochondria. Uh, you'll also see some other, uh, um, I'm just stepping back and forth through this to give you a sense of uh, the variety of uh, structures here. There's things I can't quite, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you, uh, I, I don't have it marked there, but I can tell you that what you're seeing, so this is an endoplasmic reticular sheet. The, the dark line there means one bilayer, 
And then this parallel dark line right next to it is another bilayer. And they're separate. So those are about 5 nanometers thick. And then they're separated by something that's about 10 times bigger than that, so about 40 to 50 nanometers. So, so the distance, let's say, between one sheet and another sheet is hundreds of nanometers then. OK, so a typical scale uh, between this sheet cross-section and that sheet cross-section is about two or 300 nanometers. OK? What's, uh, a, that's a great question, uh, and it relates to uh, another one, which is how, what's the distance between the slices here? These are physical slices. That is, you literally slice the tissue as if you were slicing a loaf of bread. And the thickness of the slices is about 30 nanometers. It's extremely thin, and in, in some cases, maybe a little less than 30 nanometers, between 30 and 25 nanometers. That's a very key fact. Without having that thickness, that very thin uh, slice, you wouldn't be able to see the structures that I'm going to talk about. It was crucial to have that degree of thinness. Uh, that's, uh, that's one data set. Let me show you another data set, which is remarkable for another re reason. Oh, by the way, you may have seen in that other set this kind of cloudy set of vesicles like that. Those are, that's the Golgi apparatus. So you may have seen in the textbook the Golgi apparatus, a stacked structure with vesicles all around it. But usually the textbooks portray it as very similar to the endoplasmic reticulum. But you can see, I don't know, this is very different than the endoplasmic reticulum. The separation between the, the sheets, the layers, is very different in absolute terms. And it looks more like a cloud of vesicles that just happens to have some sheet-like structures embedded in it. But it's much more uh, dynamic looking, in a sense. Uh, like you've captured some very rapidly changing cloud of activity. So the Golgi is another object of study. I won't have any more to say about it, but it's fascinating. And uh, I'd love to do a project on the Golgi. Maybe that's the next thing to work on. The reason I'm showing this other data set is because of that. What's that big round thing that just kind of popped up like a visitor? You know the story of Flatland, where Mr. Sphere comes and visits the inhabitants of Flatland? This is what's happening here. The, there's some visitor that's visiting the cross sections. Well, that's the nuclear envelope. That's the nucleus. You know it's a nucleus. There's no membrane structures inside of the nuclear envelope. So, so everywhere I circled, that's where an ER sheet is coming up and hitting the nuclear envelope itself. And so those funny, mysterious things that I showed are just uh, just slices that I grabbed. Um, there's also a mystery there. Whenever you see a gap in the nuclear envelope, that's a nuclear pore complex. It looks like the sheets are always coming in right next to a nuclear pore complex. Why is that? There's no explanation yet for that. But one can imagine a simple explanation. The nuclear pores is a defect. It's a hole. It's a topological hole in this in this double bilayer, which is the envelope. You can achieve energy minimization by taking advantage of the, effect, the fact that you have these holes already in, a, in the membrane. Just move your connection, your sheet connection, to the vicinity of that existing hole. Ah, that's just a speculation, but uh, it deserves uh, physical treatment. Anyway, I'll, I'll show you some of the tools that might allow one to treat even those things that are still mysterious. Uh, so I have to give a little background first. So as you know, uh, probably, uh, membranes in the cell are bilayers. They're two molecules thick. This is a phospholipid that I brought. Uh, I made this one myself. Uh, it's got oily tails, and it's got a, a head group. So the head group is hydrophilic. The tails are hydrophobic. So the whole thing's called an amphiphilic uh, molecule because it likes two 
likes both, you could say. Uh, it's kind of a sandwich, where the meat of the sandwich is the oily part, and the bread of the sandwich are the, the hydrophilic parts. And what's remarkable is even though the thickness there is about 5 nanometers, these create structures in the lateral direction which are thousands of times bigger easily. So you can have eukaryotic cells which are, you know, 100 microns pretty big. That's uh, um, 20,000 times the uh, scale involved in crossing the layer. Uh, so I'm just going to draw my bilayer like this. Uh, this is the structure of a sheet. It's more complicated than just a membrane bilayer. It's actually a bilayer, a bilayer, and then a layer of fluid. That's what I called the lumen. So it's a pentalayer. It's got two layers here, two layers there, and then this fluid layer in the middle. And like I was uh, saying in answer to a question, there's a scale separation here. Here, This is about 5 nanometers. This is about 10 times thicker. And what I'm showing, this is a cross-section, of course. What I'm showing in the cross-section is the edge of a sheet. An edge of a sheet, at least in this cross-section, has a large curvature. And that's how, um, this is weird. Uh, that's why one is able to have a variety of structures in the cell that, in sheets, that you can't have in just a bilayer. A bilayer can't have an edge because a bilayer, that would expose the oily bits to the aqueous environment of the cell. But here you can have something that's morally equivalent to an edge by bending the bilayer around. And that, then on a certain, if I step back a little bit, looks for all the world like a sharp edge, at least on a scale about 10 times bigger. So this is a way for the cell to have a variety of shapes you can't achieve with a single uh, bilayer. What, an example of an interesting geometry you could make, let's say this is a cross-section, and this is the z-axis, and I just rotate this about the z-axis. So I can have kind of a wormhole, whereas you can't have a hole in the middle of a bilayer, because that again would expose the meat of the sandwich. You can have a hole in this double bilayer, this is, this is the kind of geometry, this is exactly the geometry you have in a nuclear pore complex. This is the cytoplasm, this is the nucleoplasm, and this is the connection that's called the nuclear pore complex between them. And why is it called a complex? Because I'm not showing all the protein machinery that is around this wormhole. Um, so the cell seems to know, oh, that was my rotation. Uh, the, the cell seems to know the difference between inside and out. The cell knows about topology. It knows that the cytoplasm and the nucleoplasm are the same kind of stuff, and that the lumen is completely different. The lumen is separated from both of those. The lumen is its own compartment. It's topologically separate from the cytoplasm and separate from the inside of the nucleus. And that space extends throughout the whole organelle, the whole ER. OK. So, uh, so I've given you kind of a uh, physicist's quick view of what's the basic facts of the endoplasmic reticulum. How do we know uh, what I'm going to show next, or even what I've said? I'm going to start with a lightning history of electron microscopy. I'll start back in the mid-1930s when a PhD student named Ernst Ruska was working with an advisor named Max Knoll. And uh, Ruska's thesis was motivated by an analog, an analogy with light. How can, we make, how can we make a lens for electrons in the same way we have lenses for photons? So uh, that is, how can we bend electrons and image scattered electrons in the same way we do with, with light microscopy. And uh, so this is the origin, or one of the origins of, our, of electron 
uh, microscopy. Uh, this is one of the, this was published in 1941. So while the world was uh, going crazy in Europe, uh, they were producing these beautiful images in their lab. Uh, I don't know if you know what's shown here, but this is a scale bar of one micron. Uh, anyone know what that object is? What is it? An egg. Uh, not an egg. It's bacterium. a bacterium. Yeah. So that's like an E. coli, for instance. Uh, and these things, anyone know what those are? Virus. Yeah, those are bacteriophages. So this is, I think, maybe the first image of a bacteriophage. But uh, I, I only show it because it's uh, incredible. Um, but uh, it also shows that uh, you can't resolve very much about something about a scale of a micron here. But you can get a lot of details, actually, about the virus. You can see the head, if you were up close enough, is polygonal. You can see it's got a tail. Um, you, you can get a lot more uh, than you can about the, something of the scale of a micron. You, you're actually much better looking things that are tens of nanometers than uh, at the scale of microns. And this was, this, uh, was put to the use of cell biology. Um, I'm going to fast forward about 20 years to the 1950s uh, when Keith Porter had a lab at Rockefeller. And he was really uh, using this tool to aid in understanding the cell. And uh, uh, he's a remarkable person. Uh, he didn't win a Nobel Prize, but his uh, student or uh, postdoc, uh, George Pilati, did win the Nobel Prize uh, for basic work that was actually pioneered by Porter. Uh, I mean, Pilati did important things, too. But uh, it was really foundation, uh, on a foundation built by Porter. And one of the things Porter developed was this technique of serial sectioning that is taking one section after another. And he invented this device uh, called the microtome. And this is uh, one result of that. So this is a slice uh, through a cell. And you can see um, his early indications of the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, Porter coined the word endoplasmic reticulum, and the mitochondria. So you can see, uh, let me zoom in on this. Uh, the ER is this very faint network. It's very slight, just a little bit above the background, a little gray lacy structure back there. Um, again, membrane is the only thing stained here. So you can see mitochondria have a lot more membrane per unit volume than the ER does. That's because mitochondria are, have this dense, very convoluted folded membrane in their interior. Uh, per, per unit, per unit uh, area or per unit volume, it's much, uh, uh, much greater than what you'd see in the, in the ER. But the ER is a gigantic organelle. It's everywhere in this portion of the cell. And uh, uh, as you get closer to the nucleus, uh, you can resolve less and less. That's because the nucleus is much bigger. But uh, it's also because this tubular network is giving rise to a more complicated distribution of sheets as you get closer to the nucleus. Was there a question? Yeah. What's giving the contrast? Is it simply the density? Or is it no, no, you have to you not only fix your sample, but you have to have an agent which gives contrast. And What's typically used, I may have a slide about this, but um, uh, actually, I don't think I include it. Um, so it's usually a heavy element. So the, the compound that's used in the data I'll show is osmium tetraoxide. But um, uh, people often, there's also lead compounds that are used, and uranium has been used. So it's, it has to have an, a heavy element in it to scatter the electrons. So you need both. Both you have to turn the fluid environment of the cell into something the microscopists call vitreous water. And, uh, and then you also need to have a contrast agent in addition. Okay. So here's the Bloom Porter microtome. This was introduced, this is the figure from their paper. The basic structure of this device has not changed over the uh, decades. It's got a blade, a very sharp blade like a diamond blade, uh, and then a part of the apparatus which holds the sample. 
and then a, a way to move the blade against the sample. And then what's not shown here is a way to collect the slices. So here's the modern view, which has every part of that. It's got the blade is built on this little blue piece. The sample holder is uh, over there. Um, this device collects the slices that come off. So if you're slicing at 30 nanometers thickness, it's very challenging. You can't even see the slices. So how do you collect things you can't see? And this is, uh, oh, here's a close-up of the, the blade and the sample holder. And here's, a, here's how the new generation, this is Lichtman's innovation at Harvard, a rolling adhesive tape. So the rolling adhesive tape moves at a constant velocity. And if you slice at a constant velocity, then you know where the slices are going to end up on the tape. And that's great, because you not only get, you know where the slices are, this method also allows you to put them down basically in a very uniform manner. And before this, the, the, the manner of collecting slices was typically a fluid film. So you'd have a fluid layer, and the slice would go on the fluid layer. And that has some advantages if you want to do cryo or actually uh, 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 use the fact it's on water. But, uh, but uh, it has a lot of disadvantages, too, in collection. Um, now, the big disadvantage here, and it's a huge one, is that the tape itself, well, if a slice is, I don't know, 30 nanometers thick, well, what, how big is the tape? OK. <laughs> You go 100 uh, <laughs> times that, you can't do transmission elect you can't do transmission microscopy on something that thick, which you could do on the thin slices that were on the water. So you have to so what Lichtman realized, you could do scanning. So you basically you're doing scanning on the surface of the slice. And because the slice is only 30 nanometers thick, or even a little less. You don't miss so much, this is the conceit, that you don't miss so much when you go to the next slice. So, uh, so there's a big advantage in terms of the technology of collection, uh, but there's a slight disadvantage that you have to use scanning. However, you saw the data initially, if you showed that to a professional microscopist, they'd be very hard pressed to tell you that wasn't transmission. Uh, electron microscopy. So, uh, uh, so this innovation, this combination of technical tweaks to the basic microtome uh, setup and, uh, uh, with this uh, idea that you could substitute scanning for transmission led to the, the, this new type of data being taken. So this was an example. This is from the brain of a mouse. This shows the endoplasmic reticular sheets in the mouse brain. And you'll see a remarkable, so the way to read this is to go down the column, and then the next column, and then the next column, and so on. Uh, and you can see, uh, I'm going to use the language of slices, of sheets on slices. It's not quite correct, because it's all one three-dimensional structure. But this slice, this, uh, sorry, this sheet is coming into this sheet. And you can see there's a junction. And then that junction. Something weird happens. This was the piece that looked like it was coming in, but now it's flipped. Now the piece that was continuous is now on this side, and that squiggle is now connected to that sheet in a continuous way. And what you'll see is it happens over and over again. The same basic tr transition, the same junction happens here, but then this next sheet that's an edge of a sheet where it ends. That edge comes into this sheet, and there's a junction. And then it, on the other side, the same thing happens. So it's like a funny kind of staircase or wave. That's, it's a shape wave, you could say, moving through the thing. This bit of membrane with an edge comes up to this sheet. And then there's a topological connection. And now this is continuous. And this comes off and goes to the next one, and so on and so forth. That's what. That's how sheets were connected. That, so for the first time, people could clearly see how the sheets were connected to each other. 
it was this funny topological rearrangement. And so uh, this was the first model. So here's a, I'll pass this around. Uh, this is an example. Just made out of clay. The first glimpse of this was rather uh, pedestrian. Just take uh, the squiggles and make a little clay piece in the shape of the squiggle, and then go to the next slice and make another little squ clay squiggle. And then when you're done, just smush them together with your fingers to make the 3D thing. And so that's what I'm passing around. Uh, where, where is the edge in all of that? It's not these edges here. That's just because you don't have enough clay. The true edge is this blue curve in the middle. And you'll note something about that curve. Uh, it bends, but it also twists in space. So you might ask yourself, if you want to make a model of that, what kind of curve bends while it twists? And there's an obvious It's a helix. Well, locally it's a helix, but what about the global structure of it? You could say, OK, any curve locally in three spaces looks like a helix. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, this, was, uh, this is an example of you know, when I was working with Terasaki. Uh, and he first noted this structure. This is one of the first things uh, we made. It was, <laughs> it was basically what I'm passing out, uh, showing that there is a funny thing at the center of this junction. Uh, OK, so Terasaki, uh, he's an expert on nucleus and s cells uh, that have endoplasmic reticulum. He realized that uh, neurons uh, aren't the best cells for looking at endoplasmic reticulum, the best ones are secretory cells. Because secretory cells, their job is to secrete. And what does secrete mean? Secrete means that you create proteins in the cell, and then you move them out of the cell through vesicle traffic. Well, that's all very ER-based. Because the ER is the site where the ribosomes are transposed to, and then they create the protein poly, you know, polypeptide uh, translation that then becomes the protein, and that's inserted into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, and vesicles come off of that. And so, so these secretory cells have incredible ER. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a salivary gland in a mouse. It's incredible secretory cell. Oh, sorry. Uh, jumping ahead. And, uh, I'm just going to highlight what's going on in the box on the right and what's going on in this little box on the left. Again, you read this in the same way as before. But now th construct in 3D what's going on in each of those boxes, and this is what you get. So the left box is here, and the right box is follow you know, following that box is here. This is a left-handed helix, and this is a right-handed helix. And you get many, many, many turns in a helix this way. And, uh, and as far as you can see, this is the only edge in this whole sample. It's this helical edge that the, me the membrane is ending on that edge, but that is uh, the connection between sheets. So you both understand uh, the, f the nature of the edges of the sheets in their three-dimensional geometry, but you also see that uh, these, these helices are determining the global structure in the sense of the spacing between the sheets. So the spacing between the sheets is precisely the pitch of this helix. So it's a very interesting, uh, almost physics-like phenomenon going on here, that the defects in this gigantic organelle are, controlled, are controlling the global geometry of at least the sheet-like part of the organelle. Um, so this was a big deal, at least for biologists, because apparently when you publish in biology, cell is a good place to publish. And uh, it made the cover. And in fact, uh, the journal uh, made this diagram. Or they called it the parking garage model. <laughs> and it's very funny, because uh, you know, maybe the ribosomes do look a little bit like cars. 
And, uh, you know, you could make all kinds of jokes like, dude, uh, where did you park my ribosome? Uh, <laughs> and things like that. But uh, uh, I actually did a little research online about parking garages. And the idea of a helical parking garage goes back to the 1920s when people were worrying about where they're going to put all their cars because everyone was getting cars. And, uh, and uh, I didn't realize it was that qu quite that old, but people have even had ideas for helical buildings. This is a patent I found from 1967 online for helical building architecture. So these ideas that helices were special things that uh, were important even in big, the, not just the cells architecture, but the big architecture is something that's been out there. And in fact, uh, this cell biologist named Sid Tam thought this was funny. He's also a cartoonist. And he made this cartoon about parking ribosomes on the ER sheets. And it's got all these inside jokes that only a cell biologist would understand. So <laughs> I won't go into them. OK, but now what about the physical description of these? So there's a very attractive model that you could call the helicoidal model. So I, I call the biological phenomenon a Terasaki ramp because Terasaki was the first to see these. But um, in fact, uh, uh, the um, a very nice model for these is something that's been known for hundreds of years. So I'm going to make a, use this businessman's toy. Here we go. Uh, to make a helicoid. A helicoid is a minimal surface. Uh, you can get it very simply by taking uh, a stick and rotating it at a constant rate while you translate it in the z direction, let's say. So just take a stick, rotate it at a constant rate, as you, and move it up. And that traces out a surface called a helicoid. Even though, uh, and so that's what, this is kind of a helicoid. But um, uh, it ends, this stick was uh, finite, uh, but a helicoid is an infinite surface. You do, it never ends. It doesn't have any boundary, actually. Um, so how can you make a boundary like the kind we need to describe a Terasaki ramp? And in fact, there's a simple way to do it. Just take a cylinder out of the centra, center of the helicoid. So just by fiat, create a boundary by removing the cylinder from the center. And that cylinder intersects this infinite surface in helices. Okay. So now I have an infinite surface that ends on a helical edge. That's what you need to make a model for a Terasaki ramp. And so I'm just showing some mathematical models of that. Uh, so to specify you know, an absolute specification of that, you need the pitch and you need the radius that, of that inner cylinder you're removing. Uh, uh, but what's attractive about a heli uh, helicoid is, um, with or without a boundary, it's a minimal surface. A minimal surface is a precise mathematical uh, idea. It means that the mean curvature is exactly 0 at every point. And uh, for the mean curvature to be 0, it means that you have to balance curvature in one direction with curvature in the uh, a perpendicular direction at that point. And so typically, this is true of hyperbolic surfaces, which curve in opposite directions. But of course, the plane is a minimal surface because it has zero curvature at every point also. So uh, you can get uh, a large variety of minimal surfaces. Uh, you can get ones that don't have any boundary at all, like a helicoid. I was discussing with uh, uh, Brad today, uh, uh, triply periodic infinite surfaces, which are minimal. Uh, but the helicoid is a good example um, of this and very appropriate to this. So, uh, so anyway, uh, this is just defining for people who are not familiar with the idea of curvature of a surface, though everyone might be. Uh, it was a realization uh, back in Euler's time that if you look at a point on a surface and you look at the, min at the direction of minimal curvature and the direction of max maximal curvature, if such exists, that those are always 90 degrees from each other, and that an important quantity is just averaging those two curvatures. That's the same as averaging every curvature, it turns out, in that, at that point. Um, so to define a surface, uh, well, to define a free energy, so the idea is that in the cell, in particular, everything is viscously overdamped. 
I don't care about the inertia or the past history of these things. A snapshot is enough. If I want to come up with an energy for a membrane, I should be able to do that just from geometry alone. Well, what specifies the geometry other than curvature? What kind of curvatures can I have? I can have that mean curvature I discussed, but I could also have the Gaussian curvature. So in fact, uh, uh, I should use both of those, but I'll just make a historical note. It was pointed out to me, and I didn't know this, that Sophie Germain, back in the late 18th century, um, that was her period she worked in early uh, 19th century, she proposed for Elastica a very similar energy. She said, an energy should be just the square of the curvatures summed. And in fact, she got a lot of criticism from that. for that. Laplace had a really uh, damaging criticism of her prize essay on the energetics of Elastica. Uh, he, but I, I won't go through this in detail. He thought it could absolutely had to be false. Um, but I, I should point out, our modern view today is surprisingly close to this idea of Sophie Germain. Um, in fact, you could just complete the square and show that that's a certain combination of the square of the mean curvature and some linear combination with the Gaussian curvature. Uh, it's remarkable, actually, that this idea was anticipated so early. OK, anyway, here's the modern view that I could write down a free energy of a membrane. It's a, it's a functional. It's an integral over the area of the membrane of a piece that's quadratic in the mean curvature, linear in the Gaussian curvature. And for good measure, I've added a term that looks like a surface tension. That's the energetic cost of having additional area. Uh, this, this, you can see maybe uh, off the top, uh, if, you're, if you're good, uh, that a minimal surface could be one minimizer of this energy because you can't get you can't get less positive a term than 0 there, right? So if you make h equals 0, it's certainly going to uh, minimize that piece. What about the Gaussian curvature? Well, there's this theorem called the Gauss-Binet theorem that says you don't really care about the total integral of the Gaussian curvature because it's a topological constant. Many people just throw that out for that reason, because it doesn't matter for an energy if you add a constant or not add an overall constant. Uh, anyway, let me summarize another view of that. Instead of dealing with the integrals, I could deal with the, the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is the variation of those integrals. And that's a differential equation, partial differential equation. Might be hard to solve. This one's pretty easy to solve, though. If you just take the area, which is for soap films, what people usually take, as the energy, then uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation is just saying that the mean curvature should be 0 everywhere. That's the minimal surface I discussed. What if you take the Euler-Lagrange equation for this more complicated term that has the bending and the Gaussian? Then you get this partial differential equation. This delta is the Laplace operator. So in fact, uh, you know, it has some linear terms, but it also has these terms of higher order. This is cubic, and morally, uh, this is a morally equivalent to a cubic term because the Gaussian curvature uh, has a, basically operates like the square of the of the mean curvature. So, uh, so this, uh, so these terms, these two terms are cubic order, um, whereas these terms are uh, linear in H. But uh, despite this uh, nice formul formalism, uh, there is no. Mathematics has not been able to give a general solution of this partial differential equation. We have to be happy with particular solutions. Well, OK, a minimal surface is a solution of this equation. Just stick h equals 0 in everywhere, and it solves it. So that's a, that's maybe that's a one indication that we can look at minimal surfaces as candidate solutions, but there will be other surfaces which are not minimal which will also solve this. The trick is finding if they're consistent with your boundary conditions. OK. So uh, I apologize. I'm going to use a slightly different notation here. Uh, but um, right so in this, I've simplified the description of the surface a little bit. I won't go into great detail.
But now I'm going to use what's called the Monge representation. Let's imagine a surface which is just given by a height function above a basal plane. That's called the Monge representation. Uh, if you translate those equations into that representation and you assume that the gradients in the H field, that's the height field, are not too big, then you get this linear differential equation. It's still a partial differential equation. It looks very much, however, like some of the equations that you're used to solving in electrostatics. This, this in fact, is fourth order. Um, but you see, it's just really two Laplacians with this extra constant related to the bending stiffness and the tension. Uh, but again, this is solved by the Laplace equation in H. If I, if I have an H field which satisfies the Laplace equation, it would also be a solution of this. This is, like, this is what I mean by the minimal surface solving the other equation. So the theory of harmonic functions, that is solutions of the Laplace equation, is precisely the theory that you could use to construct candidate surfaces. And so yes, so there's, there's a whole theory about this. I won't go into it, but here's a nice example. I could write down just the log of a complex variable, which is given by the radial coordinate and the angular coordinate. And both the log r part and the imaginary part of that are both solutions of the Laplace equation. That's just a fact that goes back to the theory of harmonic functions. So wait, why don't I use uh, theta as a, as a mathematical description of the helicoid? That is, that's a simple, that is very simple. The height is just proportional to the angular variable. There's a length scale p, that's the pitch. So fa in fact, one can write a very ma nice mathematical description in this kind of polar coordinate for the helicoid, which is this model minimal surface. It's just the height is proportional to theta. That's it. Now, because I'm solving a linear equation, let's say I want to put two of those together. Well, I can just add one solution to another solution. Because it's linear, it should satisfy superposition principle. So I have a whole way now to construct geometries, at least minimal geometries, that are based on these uh, very simple solutions. Um, this ignores some details, which is what's going on right at that edge. It's really assuming that I've collapsed the edge of the sheet to uh, something that has zero thickness. So really, the edge, instead of being a, a semicircular tube, is now just a curve in three-dimensional space. So there's some very interesting questions about how to relate the actual shape of the membrane bending at that to this collapsed model, but I'm mostly going to uh, gloss over that right now. But I'll just mention that there's a whole subject here about what proteins are condensing along that helical edge. And there's been identified a number of proteins, reticulons, which were previously identified in tubes, also seem to be on this half tubular edge. YAP is another class of proteins. There's also another one called Lunar Park. Every time you pick up a journal in recent months, uh, you see that there might be new proteins involved in this edge. So uh, I'm not sure we have the complete parts list, but it seems the cell is very much concerned about the regulation and the control of these edges. So there's a bunch of proteins that are involved in, uh, in stabilizing these edges. Um, uh, OK, I described a single ramp in terms of these uh, simple functions. But uh, there are some problems with the single ramp from the physics point of view. And I'll just say that, uh, well, uh, even though the Gaussian curvature seems to drop off like 1 over r to the fourth, that's pretty good. That means it's getting flatter and flatter. Um, if you compute that Helfrich energy, it seems to have this nasty logarithmic divergence. And it depends on how far you compute it out to. So imagine I'm computing the energy out to a certain radius. Then that radius enters in the actual energy 
However, you can get rid of that in a nice way. You put two left-handed and right-handed together. Then you also get a log. But now the log is the separation between the cores of the left-handed and right-handed. So that's actually a physical parameter because it's related to the density of these ramps in the membrane. And now it's not an artificial cutoff. So it's much superior from that point of view uh, to have a dipole than to have a monopole. So a monopole is one of these ramps, and a dipole would be a, some correlated uh, ramp uh, pair. Uh, so that, imagine you could design a surface by putting together left-handed and right-handed ramps in certain configurations, and it gives you a whole world of geometries to construct, which I call E-origami. Okay, it's just a little joke. Uh, but, uh, but, you, but you can construct, uh, just like I'm saying, not only out of those minimal solutions that are minimal surfaces, you can also uh, try to construct these out of uh, other solutions of those equations, and some involve uh, Bessel functions and so on. Anyway, um, a quadrupole. A quadrupole configuration is another very natural and nice configuration of these. And perhaps that's important, though I have to say in the data, the microscopy data, it doesn't appear, at least in the bulk of the ER, that it's using these quadrupoles at all. Um, OK, so now I'm going to shift to something that seems completely different. I'm going to end on this topic, so I won't have much longer. Uh, that's membrane tubes. So the ER has both sheet-like morphology and tube morphology. What's the connection between the two? They do seem like topologically completely different things. Sheets are sheets. Tubes are tubes. You know, uh, what's the connection? And uh, while it's true, you could say some things like from the energetic point of view, it would be much better for a tube to come in at the edge of a sheet than right in smack dab in the middle of a sheet. Uh, there seems to be a deeper connection. And the connection has to do with three-way junctions. So this is something that Tom Powers and I worked a lot on, actually. This is using surface evolver to make, uh, to make uh, a, a junction between tubes. Uh, uh, you can see there's a funny, you know, a, a three-way junction is, is not just three tubes, but it's also the junction part. And the junction part has kind of three underarms. The three underarms are regions of negative Gaussian curvature. You might say your body has negative Gaussian curvature because it's curving like this in one direction, and it's curving like that in the perpendicular direction. And that's a hyperbolic region. Well, the inner part of a Terasaki ramp is also has negative Gaussian curvature because it's curving in two different ways. So is there a connection between these underarm regions of a junction and the Terasaki ramps? And uh, uh, well, that's just summarizing what I said. But in fact, what, what, what if you add area, if you add membrane area to a junction, can you explode the junction? That is, can you make it break up not into three tubes, but rather six semi-tubes. So if it's, you think of a junction as not three tubes, but six semi-tubes coming together. That gives you the idea that maybe I could join one semi-tube with another semi-tube in a way that's different than the, the original assignment. Uh, and then you can ask, well, is it energetically favorable for that to remain in the plane or to bend out of the plane. And it turns out that there's, uh, uh, the physics suggests that, in fact, uh, these would rather bend out of the plane than stay in the plane. And so you could ask, well, if I bend this one that way, and that one that way, or I bend that one that way, that's just the difference between a left-handed and a right-handed helix. So could it be, uh, could it be that you explode a, explode, quote unquote, a junction, a three-way junction, and off of that, you generate pairs of left-handed and right-handed Terasaki ramps. Um, I have to say, this figure is complete science fiction. 
It was drawn using an architectural CAD program uh, by one of my collaborators. <laughs> it's, you know, there's no physics calculation that went into the details of this other than this idea that there's a connection between the one part of the three-way junction and the Terasaki ramps. But to me, it's very suggestive. Uh, so uh, we hope to kind of uh, make progress on understanding whether there is a deep connection between tubular networks and these two-dimensional stacks that have topological defects. OK. So uh, I'm nearing the end of my talk, if not at the end. I want to come right back to this mystery. I started off by showing this early on. Um, could it be that these delta-like junctions are a non-trivial uh, configuration of what are basically semi-tubular Terasaki ramps in a certain geometry. And in fact, that's why you get the funny delta-shaped junctions here, because of these, uh, you really want to minimize the Helfrich energy of a configuration that involves these, uh, these topological defects. So we don't know in detail. A lot of more work has to be done on reconstructing these in three dimensions. But it's, a, it's, a, it's a, uh, part of what makes this exciting is the idea that uh, physics gives some suggestions as to what might be natural configurations for these membranes and uh, adds a layer to the biological knowledge that maybe the biologists themselves would not, never have guessed because they weren't familiar with the mathematical language that physicists are. So um, I just put up here a list of open questions. I haven't really answered uh, uh, many of these or any of these in my talk, but, uh, but the whole subject of of how to relate the morphology of organelles to its function is something that's really interesting and hardly touched upon by uh, what I talked about. So I think the future of biophysics of small structures inside of cells and looking at their architecture is, is going to be a very active and rich one. So I uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah. Where are we headed? Oh. Thanks. Uh, so, do you get the uh, pitch of the helix and thus the layer spacing from the parameters of the Hellfish energy in this theory? Uh, no. Uh, well, so you get a you get a connection between them but you don't get the absolute specification of them. So uh, that would involve, uh, you know, fundamentally knowing uh, about um, the, you know, so, so there's a couple aspects of this. Uh, so the reticulons, or the proteins that are condensing at these edges, uh, they, they, will con they have to be factored into the energy in a way. So I, I should derive from this effective, in this effective picture, an energy, a, a line energy that, that corresponds to the, the inner part of that ramp. And I, I didn't talk about that in the talk, but, but that has another parameter in it, which would give you the pitch and would give you the radius of that inner cylinder, uh, if you like. Um, the, the inner radius of that uh, helix. And uh, you can relate those to that parameter, but you still need this extra parameter. So. Thanks. Thank you. Um, what's preventing the counterclockwise uh, and cl clockwise helical ramps from merging? Oh, yeah, very good question. So. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem with the naive view of these as helicoids. If you, uh, if you write down uh, the model that I wrote, that kind of minimal model, then these should attract each other with a finite force. So they should 
merge, right? <laughs> and poof, the whole, the whole geometry uh, kind of a problem then. Um, so, uh, so you'd have to introduce another force to stabilize these. So there's a couple solutions to that. One could say, oh, well, this whole thing is coupled to the cytoskeleton in a certain way. You've got microtubules that might go through the cores of these holes in the, and sure, the microtubules are going through the whole space here. You didn't see them in the data because that was only staining membrane. But um, another solution is that maybe the minimal surface is not the right solution. You can add in a little bit uh, that, that differential equation has other solutions which aren't the minimal surface. And be, you can add them even in the Monge representation. They're there. Uh, you can add those solutions in. You get something that looks just like the here local surface. You can add it to different amounts. Uh, and that would make the force go to zero between these. So, so we don't know the answer to your question, but there's some possible solutions. External forces that aren't taken into account is one, but actually moving away from this minimal surface model and adding in those other solutions of that equation, which would modify, let's say, the unit cell of the helix to be something that's not a minimal surface anymore. That's another solution. So. Could you give us a sense of the energy scales involved in these structures? How many yeah. chemical bonds, for example, oh, gosh, yeah. per unit area would it take to uh, compete with the energy of these, these uh, sort of topological structures? Uh, without doing a detailed calculation, uh, it's going to be of order uh, uh, 50 to 100 kT, at the, where kT is, uh, you know, four piconewton nanometers in the in the language of. Uh, or a couple of ETP molecules. That's right. Yes. Well. Um, uh, maybe up to five or, or more. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So regarding the non-minimal surfaces. Yeah. So adding ribosomes to the surface uh -huh. would change its energy. Uh -huh. Is it possible that the non-minimal surfaces are not stable to that perturbation? That in some sense the minimal surfaces are attractors when you add the possibility of um, adding ribosomes to the surface that like they will naturally evolve toward one of the minimal surfaces when you perturb them with the ribosomes yeah I, I have to say this um, that particular line of reasoning I haven't pursued uh, myself but um, my attitude has been uh, ribosomes are perfectly happy on the very flat parallel portions of the sheets and the sheet a flat plane is a minimal surface right now, you could say uh, maybe ribosomes don't like the fact of Gaussian curvature, which is different than a minimal. So most, ga most minimal surfaces have negative Gaussian curvature, right? The plane is an exception. Uh, ribosomes seem very happy on the planar parts. So, uh, so, so maybe uh, the better way to formulate that, or one way to formulate your question, is to relate the binding of the ribosomes to the negative Gaussian curvature portions. Um, I don't know. Okay, good question. But but uh, but it's uh, but working with negative Gaussian curvature might be the might be the interesting thing. How do, how do solutions different solutions differ in their distribution of negative Gaussian curvature? That might be. Uh, might be a f way to phrase that, yeah. Okay, I don't know the answer, but. <laughs>